Welcome to r slash Tales from Security, where we share stories of physical security, loss prevention, protective services, and anyone in general who gets paid to watch people, etc. And the first story is, the first time I chase someone plus aftermath. Hey everyone, I'm new here, but I'm going to post a few stories about my experiences working security over the years. Some are entertaining, and some are informative. Let me know if you've had similar stuff happen. I think I was 20 years old. I had worked security for about a year and still didn't know what the heck I was doing. I was working security for Section 8 housing in Tulsa, Oklahoma. If anyone here worked Section 8, they probably know how bad it can be. I've been shot at, I had people try to stab me, I got in fights all the time, but this was towards the beginning of my employment there. My work schedule put me at 84 to 106 hours a week. I was tall, athletic, and a fast runner. I had a baton, pepper spray, taser, body armor, handcuffs, you name it except for a gun, because I wasn't 21. I was certified on all this equipment, and my company encouraged us to carry it. I also had an 18-year-old partner, who always got overexcited about everything. Anyway, in the beginning, I was with the police and a resident on the property, filling out paperwork for a burglary. I got a phone call from the leasing office that they needed my help at an apartment unit. This was pretty standard, and it didn't sound too urgent, so I told my partner to stay with the cop and finish up there. That was my first mistake. So I drove over and found our leasing office lady. She was an ex-cop and basically a superhero. Anyway, she tells me that someone may be inside this apartment, stealing stuff, because the current residents have been evicted and aren't allowed inside. The neighbors reported seeing someone coming in and out with trash bags full of stuff. Every day we get at least three phone calls, where someone is supposedly breaking into an apartment, so I didn't think it was all that bad. Once I walked inside, I saw a buff black man standing at the top of the stairs. It scared the SH out of me. I drew my taser and instructed him to come down the stairs. I literally caught this guy red-handed. He had garbage bags full of the evicted residents SH in his hands. Well anyway, he started coming downstairs and I holstered my taser to grab my cuffs. I got one hand on him and one hand on my cuffs when he bolted out the effing door. I still remember the leasing office lady yell, tase him Derek, tase him. I threw my cuffs on the ground, drew my taser and ran out the door after him. I was wearing steel plates and an SH ton of gear but still managed to keep just about 15 feet away from this guy. I knew if I deployed my taser while chasing him that there was a good chance the prongs might come back and hit me. Plus, this was an old taser. It wasn't in the best condition and didn't function well. I shouldn't have even carried the effing thing. But we ran the good old 300 meter dash to the fence. I was yelling at him the whole time to stop, but he just ran faster. I finally cornered him between a dumpster and a fence. I could see his eyes turn, trying to decide whether to fight or flee. Then he ran behind the dumpster. I thought this was awesome. The fence had anti-climbing spikes and I didn't want to fight him alone. He was pretty buff. If my taser failed, it would have sucked. I thought he'd just stay right there while I could call for backup. Anyway, up and over the fence he went. F those anti-climbing spikes, am I right? But here's where it gets good. I looked like a cop. I wasn't trying to and I wore big old patches that said security, but our uniforms looked exceedingly similar to Tulsa police at times. I'm watching this guy run away on the other side of the fence and I see a semi-truck driver jump out of his truck and point a gun right at the criminal's face. The only effing thought going through my head is OF. Oh, the guy running away did not give a single F. He ran off into the woods and I didn't see him again. The trucker kept freaking out, trying to show me his concealed carry license and I was focused on calling my partner. Yeah, I'm no hero. First guy I ever chased got away from me. I felt like a massive failure. But that's not all. The thief, Daryl Golden, was the next door neighbor of the people being evicted. He and his girlfriend Tammy Rucker were in on this together. Daryl already had some warrants out anyway and this just kinda added fuel to the fire. I called my partner and asked him to bring the cop over to my location. I explained the situation to him and let him know that Daryl was the next door neighbor. So he went to her door, knocked loudly and said, Tammy I know you're in there, open the door, this is the police. He kept trying for a minute or two and finally said, fine, F it, you're going to jail. He told us he was going to get a warrant and we all sat outside the house until more cops showed up. I believe this entire incident began at like 8 a.m. Well, at around 7 p.m. the warrant finally came through. Tulsa police smashed the door open, found the stolen property and an SH ton of mice. It was absolutely disgusting inside that apartment. Tammy wasn't inside. She escaped the second she saw me chasing her boyfriend, Daryl. So that's zero for two. Not only did I not catch the guy I chased, but his girlfriend escaped as well. But in the end, I was just glad I got the stolen property back to the evicted family. The family that was evicted was very friendly, had children and were just in a slump in life. These vultures preyed on them. Six months later, I got a piece of letter in the mail. Guess what? Subpoena. Yup, 
I got ordered to go to court for this guy. I called the prosecutor, and apparently they caught him and gave him 45 days mandatory incarceration, with 5 years probation, I think. So he spent his Christmas in jail. Same with Tammy, I think. They pled guilty before I had the chance to see them in court. All in all, good learning experience. Oh, and later on he violated probation slash parole, got an extra year mandatory incarceration. Hope you enjoyed the story everyone, I've got plenty like it. Sorry if I left any details out or if it was confusing. Oh, I forgot to mention, I've got some links for you if you want to check out the court information. The second story is, careful who you chase. In the 90s, I was the director of security at a busy DT 5-star corporate hotel with 300 plus rooms. It was New Year's Eve and I had my entire staff, 5 officers and myself on. We had an English pub on the property that was a very popular downtown hotspot and it was lined up from 1900 onwards. Most security duties that night, well, every night really, were keeping what we called undesirables from mixing with the clientele. The hotel was part of an elevated pedway system that connected most buildings in the DT core. This allowed homeless and otherwise marginalized persons access to the front of the house, whereby they would often try to get into the back of the house or the guest tower. But I digress. Around 2300, the lineup to get into the pub was becoming more aggressive. People had already been drinking at other bars, and I guess they were worried about being caught without a beverage at the stroke of midnight. The bar staff usually managed themselves. The bar manager was a seasoned professional, but due to the aggressive nature of the crowds, they asked me for some help, and I sent two of my more burly officers. Most of my squad were men and women getting security experience to support city police applications. The two I chose were a bit more gung-ho than the rest of the crew, but I thought it was a good fit for the temperament of that crowd. I went along for the ride. Upon our arrival, we found the bar manager in the process of asking a group to leave. Their crime was that one of their group was catatonically intoxicated. My guys took over the ejection, and we walked the guys right out to the cab stand on our concourse. There was a phone mounted on the wall by the hotel door. I can picture it in my mind, even though it was 30 years ago. Beige, nondescript, handset hangs on a hook on the left. In this case, no dial or keypad, as it went right to the cab company. The severely intoxicated dude, who 30 seconds before needed two people to help him walk, suddenly comes to life, rips the phone off the wall and runs down the street. My two guys look at each other, then they both look at me, and just as I am opening my mouth to say whatever, let him go, follow in hot pursuit. Our city is quite northern, and we have snow on the ground from November to March, so the sidewalks are snow covered and my guys are in dress shoes. The bigger of the two guys tires fairly quickly and drops back, but the one guy, who we find out later runs 8 kilometers every morning, chases the guy for 19 blocks. 19 blocks for a phone we don't even own. When he finally catches the guy, he puts his hands firmly on his shoulder and the drunk guy turns around and smashes my guy across the face with the body of the telephone, breaking both his nose and his left eye orbit bone. Literally gushing blood, my guy still wrestles him to the ground and cuffs him. Tired guy catches up and they both walk him back to the hotel. They radio me in advance with the details, so I call the cops and an ambulance that both arrive about the same time they do. Drunk guy goes to jail for a variety of charges, including aggravated assault. Security guy goes to the hospital, and the next time I see him, about a week later, it looks like his face was painted with a thick black paintbrush. His eyes were black and blue, and his face thoroughly effed up. The busted phone was taken by the cops as evidence. Lesson learned? Be careful who you chase, you might just catch him. A couple of other life lessons come to mind. Pick your battle, choose what hill to die on, etc. Feel free to add your own. Both of those two security guys later became city cops. We had about 90% success rates, turning security officers into cops, although one guy became an MP. Bonus anecdote. 19 block marathon man made the headlines years later. He had an odd, very memorable name that I recognized immediately on the evening news. He was charged with, and I am not making this up, whipping a handcuffed suspect he had just arrested with a coat hanger while she blew him. His defense was that as he was reading off her Miranda rights, he heard a zipper sound. Then to his chagrin discovered she was sucking him off and he was beating her with a coat hanger he found on the floor in an effort to get her to stop belating him. Yeah, right, ended his career. And the last story is, that's not how any of this works, or the tale of the tank goblin. Hello friends, today I'm back with another tale of grandiose stupidity, embellished lavish humor, and shameless hyperbole that ends in the police being called to deal with a situation a lowly security man cannot. Spoiler alert, this story ends with police. Very little effing about this time, comrades. Pull up a chair by the fire and retrieve your classiest kettle corn, for this is the time for the tale of the tank goblin. Our site, a distribution center, requires for multiple reasons, truck drivers delivering to the facility to present their driver's license to security. There's always some big brother is watching you types who are put off by this 
Because a punk A24 year old with a ponytail and authority issues is really going to somehow steal your identity just by looking at your license. But private property, our place, our rules. Play or get out. One fine day a truck driver, the great taint goblin himself, arrives and declares he has an appointment. A pet peeve of mine, I'll be the judge of that, but that's a story for another time. I retrieve his bill of lading and ask for his license, as we always do. Issue here is when asked to present a driver's license, Taint Goblin pulls out his phone and shows me on his phone a low-quality image of a driver's license, with a photo that only bears a resemblance to the man in the same way that my autistic stoner Minecraft addicted friend resembles an architect. Me, your driver's license, sir. Taint Goblin, what do you think this is? It's clear that Taint Goblin thinks this is going to fly, and as I have all four eyes trained on his twitchy, fidgeting face, it's not hard to tell he's never run any sort of con before. Unfortunately, little old me, with a decent obsession with social engineering, ain't about to let this one slide. Now, a Minnesota CDL will often have an issue date, with no end date, instead of a date issued date expired, as there's a decent amount of schooling and training needed to achieve a CDL. Because of this, a Minnesota issued CDL will often tell you exactly when the holder first became certified to drive an 18-wheeler, and this is about to become very useful. A quick glance tells me that this card was issued about a year previous to this incident. Me, how long you been driving truck? Taint Goblin, three years? Bingo. Me, then whatever this is is fake. I'll need your real driver's license now. Taint Goblin's face twitches even harder. Taint Goblin, no, this is real ID. They send to me, they do not give me card. Aside from Taint Goblin coming dangerously close to turning into the why are you running guy, there's a few issues here. Fact. Only insurance cards are legally recognized as valid when digital, and only in certain states. Fact: No state allows a shoddy screen capture of a driver's license to stand in for the genuine article. Fact: No other wipe kills germs faster than Lysol sanitizing wipes. Fact: Due to a law that states any shipping company failing to report unlawful driving can be charged as an accessory, my coworker is already on the phone with law enforcement dispatch. Me, did you honestly think this was going to work? Now Taint Goblin is twitching so hard, I'm beginning to think he may need more than the legal kind of help. As I cannot detain this guy, my job is to now keep him from leaving as best I can. Surreptitiously, I figure the best way to do this is to keep this guy talking. And talk he does. He tries to convince me over and over that his ID is real, valid and legal. He talks a bunch about his delivery that night and how this conversation is BS. At one point he even tells me as God watching over him, at which point I had to actually bite my cheek to keep my mouth shut. The entire time I'm doing the old trick, where you repeat the last thing out of someone's mouth in the form of a question, and Taint Goblin stays rooted to the spot, right up to the point where a squad car rolls up. Bless the police and all the good work they do. Of course, the good officer asks to see the guy's license, and of course he pulls one out of his wallet. This one isn't, it turns out, on his phone. Unfortunately for Taint Goblin, it's also not a CDL. Bonus things I really wanted to say after the God comment. I hope he has a good lawyer. I'm gonna need to see his ID too. When did God change platforms on the BS front? No way, Yahweh. Looks like this was a waste of a perfectly good crucifixion. I didn't know the Vatican peddled fake IDs. Thank you for listening. Have a good day.